All right, so taking a look at chapter 21, which is going to talk about toxicology. In this chapter, we are going to discuss several different things um, like poisons, toxins, how different medications can affect the body, and what can we do to intervene and when should we intervene. So every day we as humans come into contact with things that are potentially poisonous. So even things that you would think would should not normally harm you can be toxic in the right amount. Um, so thinking about like Tylenol, if you take the appropriate dose of Tylenol when you have a headache or a fever, that's not going to hurt you. But if you take too much or if you take it too often, that could potentially cause damage to your body. Acute poisonings affect 2 million people each year, and so we're going to talk about how some of those are accidental and some are intentional. And chronic poisoning is a little bit more common, and this is usually a result of some type of substance abuse or like an intentional overdose. So toxicology itself is the study of toxic or poisonous substances. So let's break some of those terms down. Poison is any substance whose chemical action can damage body structures or impair body function. And so it's very important that you understand the difference between poison and toxin. Toxin is going to be that poisonous substance, but it's going to be produced by bacteria, animals, or plants. So even though poisons can be toxic, a toxin itself is going to be based off of bacteria, animals, or plants. Substance abuse, that term is the misuse of any substance to produce a desired effect. And so as we see in this PowerPoint, that could be any number of things. It could be something that's not even intended to produce that effect. So I'll just use um, like a aerosolized keyboard cleaner that people can use for huffing. Um, that is intended obviously for a cleaning purpose, but when it is misused or abused um, in an intent to produce that desired effect, that's where it becomes a problem. And then an overdose is classified as a toxic dose of a drug. So again, anything can potentially cause an overdose, any medication, even if it's something like a vitamin. Um, if you would take too much of that, it can be toxic to the body. So these are some typical signs and symptoms of specific types of overdoses. And so I just want to take a minute to look at a few of these that we have mentioned before, but look at them in a little bit more detail. So we have first up top opiates and opioids. And the difference here is that opiates are naturally based. So they usually come from like plants and opioids are synthetic or man-made. So they produce the same signs and symptoms, but just knowing that one is natural and one is man-made. So those examples there are going to be things like morphine and codeine for the natural opiates and heroin, uh, methadone and oxycodone are a few examples of opioid medications. They produce, like I said, the same signs and symptoms. And so very important that we know, and we've discussed this many times with the potential use for Narcan, and this is a big deal in our country right now with the opiate crisis. Um, so hypoventilation or potentially respiratory arrest, pinpoint pupils, sedation or coma, and hypotension. And so again, we know that those are the biggest things that this can cause and we're going to talk about a little bit later when we need to recognize uh, it and a time that we need to intervene and then how we're going to do that with medication. The next one here is a sympathomimetic and that means it mimics your sympathetic nervous system so your fight or flight and those examples of these medications are epinephrine, albuterol, cocaine, and methamphetamine. So again like epinephrine and albuterol those are medications that we can utilize um, at the EMC level to give our patients but in, in high doses if we were to give too much it can become toxic. So some signs and symptoms we might see from these are hypertension, tachycardia, dilated pupils, agitation or seizures, and hyperthermia. So it would take like epinephrine and albuterol large doses of that. With cocaine and methamphetamines, this can happen even with small doses. Um, so remember, this is going to cause an increase in heart rate and in blood pressure. And you might see some test questions that ask about that.
The other concern there is what kind of damage it's doing to the cardiac muscle. Um, you certainly can experience chest pain, ischemia, even a, a cocaine-induced MI. Um, those types of things are definitely possible. Moving down to the next one, you see sedative hypnotics and some examples provided are like diazepam, um, midazolam, and those are fairly common um, drugs that are given even in an EMS setting by your ALS provider. So things that we need to watch for and consider if a patient has taken some of these medications are slurred speech, sedation or coma, hypoventilation, and hypotension. Moving back down to the next one, which is an anticholinergic. And so that's going to be the exact opposite of what we see down on the bottom. So we've heard of that cholinergic medication like organophosphates, nerve gases, weapons of mass destruction. And we've mentioned that that's where we see these signs and symptoms of sludgeum. And so those that's salivation or sweating, uh, lacrimation, which is excessive tearing of the eyes, urination, defecation. That could also be drooling and diarrhea. Uh, G, gastric upset or GI upset and cramps, emesis or vomiting, and then the M, which was recently added on in the last few years, is muscle twitching or meiosis, which could be pinpoint pupils. And so, uh, again, we've mentioned that that's um, a major concern, and the treatment for that is an anticholinergic medication, which we know for us at the EMC level would be atropine and or prolidoxime. And when those two medications are used together, that is called duodote, and that's packaged in an auto injector for emergency use. But too much of anything, again, can be a bad thing. So anticholinergics like atropine or diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl, um, those can actually cause side effects of their own, like tachycardia, hyperthermia, hypertension, dilated pupils, dry skin and mucous membranes, sedation, agitation, seizures, coma, delirium, and decreased bowel sounds. So just want to be familiar with what those cause, what they are, and then, again, make sure that we understand um, that even providing treatment can sometimes cause its own set of signs and symptoms. So we want to make sure that we are asking the appropriate questions to the patient. So what did you take? When did you take it or become exposed to it? How much did you ingest? Did you have anything to eat or drink before or after you took it? That's going to affect the absorption rate if it was something that they ingested. Has an antidote been given since the ingestion? So have they tried to make themselves vomit? Have they contacted poison control? Have they drink water or milk or something to try to deactivate it? And then how much do you weigh? And that weight question is very important for a lot of reasons. First, we need to know it um, if we were going to be giving medication like activated charcoal. Remember, we have a standard dose for adults, but usually for children, that's going to be weight-based. So that's a big thing we need to know. And also to be able to pass on to the hospital for any additional medications that are going to be weight-based that they might need if the patient was to progress to become unresponsive by the time we get to the hospital. We're going to try to determine the nature of the poison, so we're looking around in the immediate area for clues and taking any suspicious materials or packages with us. Um, those containers at the scene can sometimes provide critical information. We want to look at the vomit for any pill fragments, and that's the same um, could be said if they vomit in your presence, even in route to the hospital. We want to take a look at it to see, is there any blood there? Also, is there any pill fragments, things like that? And then note and document anything unusual that you see about the patient, bystanders at the scene. Uh, we're not sure whether this was intentional, if it was accidental. Could it potentially be a crime scene later down the road? So we want to have some really good details. So how do poisons enter the body? Um, there are four routes that we are going to consider, and that's inhalation or by inhaling or breathing, absorption through the skin, ingestion by mouth, or injection into the uh, blood system or veins uh, right away. So your treatment is going to depend on how the poison got into the patient's body a lot of times. And so these pictures here are just examples or demonstrations of each one of those. So up top on the left, you see inhalation. Again, this guy's inhaling some rubber cement. Um, next to that, you that's going to be um, absorption through the skin. That's a powdered chemical on his skin. Down in the bottom left, that would be ingestion or appeal by mouth. And then you also have um, the last one there, injection.
So inhaled poisons, uh, we want to move the patient to fresh air immediately, and they might even require some supplemental oxygen. We want to be really suspicious of this. If we have any type of, um, if we have more than one patient with the same symptoms in that area, we don't want to enter. Remember, we want to use our PA system and have the patient move out to us. Um, we can call a hazmat team if a patient is not able to exit the area. Um, we definitely want to make sure that they are being transported if they have inhaled a poison. Because even if you don't see signs and symptoms right now, imagine what could potentially be being done to that lung tissue. Right? That you could have airway burns that are developing. You could have pulmonary edema that is developing. Um, a lot of different things that could be going on here. So we definitely don't want to leave them alone and refuse them if we can encourage them to go to the hospital. Some patients can use inhaled poisons to commit suicide in a vehicle, so some things to consider for those of you who are participated in night ops, you may have seen or heard about um, this scenario. We did use a chemical detergent scenario where multiple chemicals were mixed inside of that tightly sealed vehicle to create a gas chamber. It's a little bit different than the exhaust fumes where the patient would run a tube from their exhaust pipe into the vehicle or use this in a crank car in a garage type scenario. Different methods here uh, because the poison is going to be different. Either way, when you open the door, so let's say a patient had their car in a garage and it was running, if you suspect that, you cannot open that door until someone with the proper PPE is there with a self-contained breathing apparatus to gain entry because you don't want to be overcome. And again, same thing with the chemical and detergent suicide. If you witness that scenario, those providers needed to wait for um, their a hazmat team to get there so that it did not overcome them as well and have them become victims. It's very important that you remember that if you are overcome for any reason, then you're not helping anybody else and you're creating an additional strain on the system by needing help yourself. So definitely want to exercise scene safety and proper precautions here. Looking at absorbed and surface contact poisons, they can, these can affect the patients in a variety of ways like skin, mucous membrane, or eye damage depending on where it was absorbed through, chemical burns, rashes, and it can also lead to systemic effects, most often going to be related to breathing. We want to distinguish between contact burns and contact absorption. So, um, you know, it, or is there blistering to the skin? Where did it actually enter into? Uh, where, what is, where was it absorbed? into. Signs and symptoms can include a history of exposure, so they know they've come into contact with it, maybe accidentally. There might still be liquid or powder on the patient's skin. They might have burns, itching, irritation, redness, potentially an odor of a substance. We want to avoid contaminating ourselves or others, but we do want to remove the substance as rapidly as possible and remove all contaminated clothing. So if this is a dry powder, brush it off of the patient before you use any type of water because we don't want the water to activate it. Have them remove all of their clothing and then we're going to flood them with water for about 15 to 20 minutes and then followed by washing with soap and water. If it's liquid that's there, then again, we want to remove all of the clothing. Ideally, you would cut that clothing away from the patient because just imagine if they have this liquid or powder on their skin and they're trying to raise that shirt over their head. So cutting their clothing off, assisting them with that uh, could be beneficial to help stop the spread. Um, and then, like we said, rinsing for 15 to 20 minutes. If a chemical has been introduced into the eyes, we want to irrigate them quickly and thoroughly. And this is one example of how we can do that. This is using a nasal cannula. And so the nasal cannula can be attached um, to a bag of saline. It can be, um, you can have sterile water being poured into the tubing of the nasal cannula. But this is going to be the most effective way to rinse both eyes at the same time, um, just because it's going to rinse from the inside out, which is what should be done because if we were rinsing from the outside in, it's going to be circulating back through the conjunctiva of the eye, back through the tear ducts, and it's just going to be reintroducing the chemical again and again. So washing from the outside in, have both um, both eyes at the same time. Again, this is going to be really effective and it will allow you to help provide a continuous flow.
If this is in an industrial setting, they might have safety showers or specific protocols available to them. So utilize those, even if you're in a school setting. So think about like chem uh, labs and things like that, where they have eye wash stations or showers. Utilize what you have available to you if those are there. Um, the hazmat team can be available to assist you if you need them. Ensure that you, your team, and the patient are thoroughly decontaminated, especially before getting into that enclosed space of the ambulance. You're probably going to want to get your material safety data sheets or MSDS sheets from the chemicals as well and they are required to have those and produce them for you um, so that you can see what type of chemical it is what what it reacts to what's going to help deactivate it and that can be really useful for the hospital as well so I'm going to end this portion of the video right here and we'll pick up in part two